Thank you very much. It is a delight to be here, and I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to debate um, questions that obviously matter to us all. Um, I am going to key off very quickly your sense that there is a, a sort of erosion of the Western institutional frameworks with which we have lived for at least 70, 100 years. That I agree with. I'm not sure I agree entirely with the consequences of that. So that's kind of what I want to play with. Um, the title of this particular panel is Ongoing Conflicts in the Middle East. And so that's where I want to start, which is to really ask, this is my puzzle, um, who's fighting whom? And I don't think that's as clear cut a question as we typically suggest. Some of the conflicts in the region are clearly state conflicts. So we see Saudi Arabia being all mad at Iran, and they're defining themselves as states. On the other hand, we see both of them portraying themselves or, or you know, behaving as if they are actually leaders of representatives of religious communities. So the Saudis will be defending the Sunni heartland and the Iranians are supposed to be the leaders of the Shia revolution and so forth and so on. So this isn't states, this is something else. And then sometimes you see what really appears to be family feuds. Um, I think that's one of the ways to understand the uh, Saudi um, and Emirati debates with the Qataris, that these are about families, they're not about states. So the question is really who, what is the, the animator of the kind of conflicts that we see today. Um, I, and I could go on. I mean, in Libya, you see towns fighting with each other. What, you know, they're not, so what is it that people are organizing themselves around? Um, and it, does it depend, in a sense, on the perspective that, you know, so for 150 years, we've had the, is it a duck, is it a rabbit? Um, so is Saudi Arabia being a duck or a rabbit when it's being a state or a religious, you know, custodian of the holy places? Or maybe it's a goat because it's also a ruling family. I mean, how do we know? This is a gestalt problem, but I think as analysts, it's important for us to begin to think about what it is that's animating the competition and conflict. Because if we believe, as I do, that we are in fact seeing the erosion of the state system for a variety of reasons, then what is, what's replacing it? What is coming on? What are the other kinds of things that might be what will organize conflict and cooperation in the region? Um, and I think we see all across the region, we've seen this sort of, is it a duck, is it a rabbit? Israel is sometimes a state and sometimes a Jewish Homeland, obviously Iran is sometimes a state, sometimes an Islamic revolution, so forth and so on. So my question then is, how do we understand and what are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about when we think about the strength of states in the region? And you know, we'll have all of us, including me, we'll talk about you know, the Egyptians as if the Egyptians is a self explanatory identity and that we all know what an Egyptian is. An Egyptian is, you know, lives within that particular, that's Egypt, right? But I'm not sure that that's actually an adequate way of describing the levels and character of the identities that animate conflict. And we need to then think about what kinds of, where these states came from, what alternatives there are. This is partly uh, at least a uh, reflection of the kind of shift in the world that Jacks talked about that we see perhaps a, a you know a kind of decline of the West or decline of Europe in the face of a increasingly important China and so forth. I actually think I would say it's 
slightly different from that. That's a symptom of something. And that something is um, what has been described as globalization. And so I'm going to quote a foreign policy pundit, who I will identify after I'm finished reading this, um, about what the world is going to look like in 25 years. Nation states will not disappear, but they will share power with a large number of powerful non-sovereign actors, a larger number than ever before, including corporations, non-governmental organizations, terrorist groups, drug cartels, regional and global institutions, and banks and private equity funds. Sovereignty will fall victim to the powerful and accelerating flow of people, ideas, greenhouse gases, goods, dollars, drugs, viruses, emails, and weapons within and across borders. The world 25 years from now will be semi-sovereign. It will reflect the need to adapt legal and political principles to a world in which the most serious challenges to order come from what global forces do to states and what governments do to their citizens rather than from what states do to each other. So if this is true, and this, Steve, is your boss, Richard Haas. <laughs> Exactly. So this is so. It, but if this is true, if he's right, and I think this is correct, I think we need to be thinking about the consequences of states that are predatory in their own territories of what these forces are doing to undermine states as the principal organi organizing structure of international society. So. We now have a situation in which the world, the state is not seen as formally sovereign, as not seen as a mechanism for the allocation of rights and responsibilities on, among formally, so, formally equal citizens via a monopoly of the legitimate use of force within a given territory. That's a state. And much of the people who live in this part of the world don't experience life that way. They don't, their first identity is not as a citizen of a state that allocates rights and responsibilities to them and that monopolizes the legitimate use of force. So what do they live in? What are the kinds of communities that they live in? Um, and how do we understand what the political landscape will look like when there are not only states but competitors to states, alternative identities, alternative organizational structures? And clearly, some of this we see beginning to appear, as I suggested earlier, in trying to figure out, to puzzle out who's in conflict with whom. But it's pretty apparent that what we think of as state bureaucracies are actually very often administrative bureaucracies for other kinds of purposes. Many of the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council can be understood as well as family-owned businesses as they can be as states in a conventional sense. So if you think of them as family-owned businesses with a seat at the UN, in many respects, a lot of the policy that they undertake is clearer and better, uh, easier to understand that way. Obviously, sometimes you see these bureaucracies and administrations serving as religious hierarchies, again, rather than or in addition to being state bureaucracies. Um, Sometimes you see them serving the purposes of what we would call warlords. Much of this, what would be the state bureaucracy in Libya is not a state bureaucracy. It's entirely captured by various participants in the conflicts within the country. So we see bureaucracy sometimes, but it's not necessarily an indication that these are the bureaucracies of the states to which we, because we operate in a world where we can draw territories in a map that we associate. So if this is a plausible way of beginning to think about this, as we see the Chinese serving as one of the biggest investors in the region, are they actually, is this sovereign China or is this from the perspective of the recipients an opportunity to develop more business and commercial relations around the world? Not altogether clear that we can sort that out as effectively as we could have if we were thinking about this region 70 years ago. So I agree with the historical perspective, but I'm going to start um, with the end of the Ottoman Empire. 
So the question then becomes, why is this kind of confused landscape with states in some respects and other alternative identities and, and cleavages and sources of conflict and so forth as visible as it is in the Middle East? And in that sense, I think the question about what next could also be apropos the various ways you can think about what next means. I, in some ways, what's happening in the Middle East could be what is what's next for everyone that this, conf this proliferation of identities and proliferation of ways to organize social and political life we see in this region, but it may be that this is the tip of what will be a historical trend um, across the globe. So the question then is, why is it that we can see it better here now than we can see it in other parts of the world? And I will quickly make an argument about the character of the state as it developed in the region, and the character, therefore, or I would argue, therefore, of its erosion. So very quickly, um, most of these lines on the map are artifacts of about 100 years ago, and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and the period of European control direct European control of the region. So yes, the Europeans were influential in the region, but not, didn't really control it uh, until it was apparent that if the British and French couldn't divide it up, they would be fighting over it. And during the interwar period, they didn't want to have to do that. Um, so the creation of the League of Nations in 1919 was really the beginning of the effort to export the model of a European style nation state around the world. Okay, so this was exported through the mechanism of the mandates and protectorates that preceded the mandates and so forth in the region, essentially at that point. And the League of Nations was the mechanism by which that was going to happen. It created a uh, the mandate system in the region. And again, when I say mandate system, I know that Tunisia was a protectorate from the 1880s, but I mean that kind of model. That system essentially permitted and indeed virtually demanded something like quasi-independent state existence in the absence of either a strong military or sound finances. So you have the imposition of the expectations of a modern European style state without the capacity to tax and without the capacity to really conscript an independent and autonomous, mil autonomous military establishment. Um, the Europeans didn't care because having come relatively late to the region as direct control, what they cared much more about was geostrategic um, control of the region and access to India and so forth, um, as opposed to the economic value of these territories. So they really wanted the, the security and they wanted prestige. So that meant that the way they organized the control of the territory was essentially without much extraction. The only thing that was extracted was oil and they spent a lot of money. So when the countries became independent, they were provided with an administrative structure that was very good for distribution and very bad for extraction. And we can go through that in more detail. But the point is the independent countries were tutelary, like their predecessors. So the new governments were, were not accountable to their own citizens. They distributed a lot. They were welfare mechanism systems. And they didn't extract. What that ultimately was to mean is that the, those governments, because they weren't extracting, also didn't pay much attention. So their, their record keeping was slovenly. Their attention to their citizens was haphazard. They would you know, say, OK, everybody can have bread. Everybody can have electricity. Everybody can have all that sort of stuff. But we don't even know who everybody is. So if you look at the record keeping, the Egyptians and didn't ha have any idea how many Egyptian workers were in Saudi Arabia in the 1990s. No, no numbers in either Libya or Egypt of how many Egyptians were in Libya. Just completely didn't pay any attention. What happened as a result of that? The authority and capacity of these states further diminished, 
in favor of huge informal economies. So more than half the commercial transactions in the region are unrecorded. And in Algeria and Egypt, many more than that, much, much larger percentage than that. So how are these commercial transactions managed? Well, they begin to be managed on the basis of these other kinds of identities. So you go to your co-religionists, you go to your family, you go to your neighborhood. This is how the small scale system worked. So when you look at the erosion of the state and you see, so now we have all of these other kinds of groups, but we know very little about how they work. We know very little about how they cement the loyalty that the commercial transactions and so forth presumably represent. But those are the kinds of things that are competing with the state against each other and are shaping the landscape of the region today. Thank you. <laughs>